Come to prayer with me this day. Loving God, you are the one who continues to show us the way within our lives as you allow us to fulfill that perfect will that we are able to do. And just because we're still not together and a part of the gifts that come to being with one another, you have shown us that the church is still alive. Whether we are together or apart, you have never left us behind and you continue to allow us in that unfailing gift of your presence each and every moment. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day and the words that come from my mouth along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. Let them ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Over the past four weeks since Ash Wednesday, we have been in our series titled Lent. And we've been taking a look at the life of Jesus and the journey that Jesus took to the cross from the accounts in Scripture. And we know that Lent is that time or that season between Ash Wednesday and Easter that has allowed us to prepare our hearts as we've been looking inward and having that time to reflect on that invitation that Christ is to come and to continue to have that powerful work within us. And throughout this series, we've been using scripture as a guide on this journey to the cross or the resurrection. In this morning's scripture lesson in Romans 8, that some say that that particular scripture is the crown jewel or the creme de la creme of what the Bible is. I've heard it said that if everything else was stripped out of scripture and all you had was Romans 8, we would have enough to remind us that the truth and promises of Jesus Christ are there along with the power of the Holy Spirit. I just have to say that throughout all of this, that everyone has been through this past year, through all the roughness and all the difficulties, that possibly Romans 8 could be somewhat of that anchor for each of us, reminding us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That we also need to remind ourselves that we continue to be the Spirit and that God will never disappoint us. Now, leading up to this particular chapter in Romans 8, things are a bit dark and gloomy, and that we see that Paul is writing to the Church of Rome. And in my opinion, I'd say that the first chapters 1 through 7 are kind of that dark and dreary side or that spiritual heaviness that remind us of our human condition, of our own predicament, that all of us fall short of that glory of God. We are broken and we are sinful. We are desperate and we are in need of that grace. And in the particular portions that we read in Romans 7, it's like almost that you can feel the weight of the chains that are around our wrists and ankles. That weight that is from that brokenness and that sin. And by the time we get into Romans 8, those chains are falling off. And as we are Christians are invited to think about what life and Jesus Christ really looks like. And we heard right off the bat that there is very good news for each and every one of us. Therefore, we are told that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do it was because of the weakening of the flesh. God did this by sending his own son in the likeful of sinful flesh to be that sin offering. And so God condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met within us, who do not live according to the flesh, but live according to the spirit. I mean, right off the bat, the very first thing of the news, the good news is for each of us, and that we hear, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, when we talk with Christ, we will experience things like conviction. And what conviction means is that the Holy Spirit is working within our heart, bringing things to life and to make us turn from what we seek 
and what we seek is the forgiveness. Still there is no conviction, but still there is conviction, but no condemnation. So in other words, there is no being put to death for our sin and brokenness are for who we are in Christ Jesus. I want to point out that the in Jesus is mentioned at least 87 times that I can think of just in the New Testament. In Christ, because when you're in Christ, things change. Paul talks about how the law was powerless because at the end of the day, the law is dependent on you and me. You see, the law is dependent on human flesh and being dependent on humans holding up their end of the deal. And of course, we know the great predicament of the heart, which is we think we know better than God. And so as long as the law is dependent on us, we'll never be able to save ourselves. We also heard this morning that those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on things of the flesh. Those who live by the Spirit on things of the Spirit, the mind of the flesh is death, but that of the Spirit is life and peace. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I think that in the times we live in, we could all use a little bit of peace and life in our lives. But we also hear Paul say, the mind of the flesh stands in opposition to God. It is not subject to God's law, yet indeed it cannot be, since those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You have to feel Paul's excitement here as he's writing through the pages, saying that into our hearts, telling us that we are not in the realm of the flesh, but we're in the realm of the spirit. If you recall from last week, we talked about the contrast between life and darkness, or better yet, the light and the darkness, and that this is really what we're talking about even this week. It is an invitation to truly make Jesus a significant part of each of our lives. As we've gone through this passage in Romans, we read again of the contrast between the light and the dark being this contrast is between the flesh and in the spirit. My interpretation of all this is that whether we have a choice between living in a domain of me or living in that domain of God. We can either live in this realm of me and what I want and what I desire and what I seek after, or we can live in God's realm. We pretty much see that each of Paul's sentences that Paul is contrasting between these two approaches of life. And this excitement in the voice as he says, there is no answer. There is an area to, continue, to be continued over promising and that we need to be under delivering in our own lives. And of course, we know that the answer to all of this is Jesus Christ. If you flip around a little bit through scripture and you go into 1 Corinthians, around chapter 15, we hear Jesus as, just as everyone dies because we all belonged to Adam and everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Now, I believe at this point we're being asked, do we either belong to Adam or do we belong to Christ? I think we need to ask ourselves, what camp or domain are we choosing to live in? The camp of me? or the camp of God? And whose terms are we living by? Are you living on your terms in life or are you living on God's terms in life? I can't think of a better time to ask these questions and put them into reflection as I know for a lot of us that pretty much of everything in our lives has been canceled, like our sporting events, our activities with our friends, outings, you name it, things have changed in our lives. Are you set on doing things according to your own will, or are you set to doing things according to God's will in God's time? When we look at the way we spend our time and our money and our resources, do we reflect on the pursuit of our own satisfaction, 
or the satisfaction that comes within God. Now we need to keep in mind that I'm not sharing how that we've been spending our money during this time of quarantine because I'm sure a lot of it has been spent on grocery delivery, paper products, and all of course takeout because of the way we have to live. But what I'm talking about is the big picture of our life. As you think about how you spend your resources, your time, your money, does it reflect a pursuit of your own glory or does it reflect that of God? I sometimes think that there's a misconception that all of us by default are children of God, but that's not true. But we are born in the image of God. So what that means is that every person is born in that image of God, but not necessarily be considered that child of God. Every person is an infinite worth of value and every single person in this world, God desires that intimate and personal relationship with. But I will say that the title child of God is reserved exclusively for those who, as Paul says, that are in Christ. When we become a child of God, well, it changes everything. You're given the key, keys to God's house, along with all the benefits that God has living in God's house. All those promises of what life is like. And don't even begin to compare to the true experiences of the life of Jesus. We get that full spirit and living in the glory of God. Paul tells us that the world of me is powerless and it leads to the minds that are focused that bring shame and pain. It makes us slaves to fear, as Paul indicates. But Paul tells us that when we're in the spirit of God, we are filled with righteousness. We're full of meaning and our minds are set on God. God is in us. We are full of peace. We are sharing our suffering with Jesus to the glory of God. Now, making it somewhat practical for our real life situation and what does it look like to live in the world of me when your heart is dominated by fear and anxiety. If your heart is dominated by anxiety and fear, that definitely is not being in the spirit of God. But when we are in the spirit, life looks a lot different. And when we are focused primarily on how I can love and serve others, we take that focus. It may just be staying at home. That's how I can love and serve others by making the most of my time of just staying at home and having my relationship with God and others. Paul makes it clear that we are in the spirit and that we are not those slaves, but we talk about the freedom and the hope in Christ. As we draw to the end of this journey of this time, as we enter the cross or as we come to Easter, we need to know that the spirit of love and peace and trust and hope and joy continue to live within us as we live in God's realm. As always, I bring blessings to you each and every day, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. May we continue our Lenten journey with one another. Amen.